Hello. We'll let everyone connect here. Yeah, if all the guests will mute while you're on, I guess we didn't uh, do the fancy services. To, we've got just a few more people connecting. Okay, there, I think everyone that's in the room right now is connected. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Paul Brunn application uh, grant uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, today, we have Amanda Terrell, who is the head of the SHPO office, who will give an overview. She's also a member of the Heritage Ohio Board of Directors. Mary Beth Hirsch will be going through the rules uh, of the application and then Frank Quinn will be going through the application and we will be stopping for questions because uh, it is pretty complicated but we're delighted to offer this and Amanda why don't you get started. Thanks Joy. Hi everyone. I'm Amanda Terrell. I'm the director of the State Historic Preservation Office or the SHPO as we call ourselves which is a division of the Ohio History Connection. In April of this year, Heritage Ohio and the SHPO partnered on the submission of an application to the Paul Brune Historic Revitalization Grants Program, which is being funded by the National Park Service. And we found out about the award in August. And we were just thrilled to be awarded this grant as we are one of eight states this year that's being funded. So the project that's being funded is the creation of a competitive re-grant program to which Main Street, application, Main Street organizations in qualifying rural Ohio communities are eligible to apply. And the applications involving rehabilitation work on historic buildings that will spur economic development. Properties that are eligible for the funding must be listed in the National Register of Historic Places, either individually or as contributing to a National Register listed district. And the amount that is available to regrant is $446,327. So as you may already know, and as we will talk about today, Heritage Ohio and the SHPO are also partnering in the execution of this grant. The SHPO is handling overall administration of the grant and Heritage Ohio is managing the subgrant activities. And as you also know, Pre-qualified Main Street programs are assisting with getting good projects considered for subgrant. So thank you for your assistance thus far, and thanks in advance for helping us get this money out to worthwhile projects in your community. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mary Beth Hirsch to get into some of the details of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Hi, everyone. Um, as Amanda said, we're really, really excited to be able to offer this new grant program in Ohio. And I am going to share my screen here and we'll get started running through um, all the various rules and regulations that come along with uh, federal grants. And I do invite you to um, ask questions as we go, but I'll also uh, stop at the end of my section and invite uh, questions and, and conversation about this. 
Um, as Amanda pointed out, we have about $446,000 that will be regranted. And if that were to be divided evenly among four uh, organizations, which we're you know, kind of anticipating we'll end up with four to six uh, projects being funded, uh, that would mean about 115,000 in federal funding um, for each community. Heritage Ohio will be managing these uh, grants. And so your contact will be Frank Quinn at Heritage Ohio. Uh, and the organization will soon be moving to um, our building on East 17th Avenue in Columbus. So we're, we're excited to welcome them to the Ohio History Center. Important dates for this program you see are the application due date of February 8th. Um, our plan is to announce awards by the 1st of March. And then the grant period will run from March through December of 2022. So as you've heard, uh, the purpose of this program is to rehab historic buildings in rural communities, which the National Park Service defined as communities uh, with a population of 40,000 or less. Properties must be listed in the National Register and uh, our office is available to help you to, uh, if your property is individually listed or contributes to a National Register listed historic district. That information is really not available on the internet anywhere that I'm aware of. So you will need to contact us to make sure that you're working with a contributing property in a district. And uh, you'll see further down on the uh, guidelines here, how to contact our office. These grants will be awarded on a reimbursement basis. That means that applicants will be expected to finance the project through at least significant completion of part of the work um, before there will be any reimbursement. Uh, optimally, from our standpoint, there would, there would be one grant payment at the end. Um, so that means, again, that the owners will need to finance the projects up front and get reimbursed. And reimbursement is based on um, good records of the work that was done and photographs of completed work. These grants can represent up to 90% of a project's cost. So it's a 90-10 funding situation. That doesn't, well, any, any questions on that? All project work must meet the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation. Um, Heritage Ohio is hosting a webinar next week um, that will include Mary Angela Feaster, who heads the Technical Preservation Services Department in our office, and she will walk through these 10 broad standards that uh, our office uses for basically everything we do, all interactions we have with um, projects throughout the state. Um, they are broad guidelines that um, kind of need to be interpreted on a project by project basis, but still um, hearing that webinar next week will be very important for Main Street organizations to be able to help uh, guide property owners as they think about what projects they can submit. When projects are awarded, um, the proposals for uh, actual work will need to be reviewed by all of the organizations involved in overseeing these projects. We will expect to see fairly detailed plans and specifications um, prepared and uh, provided to Heritage Ohio. They will work with us and even with the National Park Service on reviewing work prior to the commencement of projects starting. I do wanna make clear that the uh, cost of preparing plans and specs and uh, project oversight, which you'll see later, um, those are eligible under this program. We will be providing a sign template that recognizes all the uh, funding supporters for awarded projects. That's another federal requirement there, that there be such a sign. Um, 
progress reports will be required each six months so that everyone involved can can understand the status of projects and this helps identify any problems that uh, owners might be having with contractors or you know suppliers anything that might come up that uh, is impeding the, the progress of the project our goal is to make sure these projects get completed successfully and on time and so getting these periodic reports helps everybody um, stay uh, up to date on the status of a project so uh, who are the eligible applicants private property owners nonprofits even uh, public agencies can apply what really matters is that it the property is income producing or will become in produ income producing as a result of the project. Again, the property is listed on the National Register and it's located in one of the 17 communities eligible to apply. I also wanna point out that uh, ownership can be defined as including a long-term lessee of a property. And in the case of this program, that would mean either a 15 or 20 year lease needs to be in place uh, depending on the amount of the grant award. Um, issue these uh, guidelines also include a phone number, but our office can be reached at, at this email address, uh, again, to help you uh, make sure that you understand whether the property is uh, a contributing uh, building in a historic district. What the program funds is basically pre-development work, architectural plans and specs, um, oversight and administration of a project, and the actual rehab rear and or exterior. Work may not be started before the grant award. So you don't wanna be starting work before the 1st of March or before um, Heritage Ohio, our office and the Park Service has had a chance to look at the plans and specs and approve them. Federal procurement standards um, come into play uh, that need not be a big scary thing. What we're trying to make sure of is that um, there is open and fair uh, availability to uh, bid on these projects. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, sealed bidding and in the newspaper and all that sort of thing. Uh, we will work with um, recipients on this in more detail, but what we want to see happen is that um, plans and specifications are shared with enough contractors to optimally bring in three proposals on our all projects. That's what we're really looking for. It's not absolutely required, but that is the goal. Uh, again, pro projects need to meet the Secretary's standards for rehab, which we'll go into more detail with you next week and, and beyond. We also would like to know at the local level that a project is being overseen by a person who meets uh, professional qualification standards that have been established by the National Park Service. And that um, basically means uh, an architect, an architectural historian or a historian. What we're looking for is someone who has uh, some level of experience with rehabilitation of historic property because it's a little bit different as, as you all know than um, working on new construction. Again, we- Sorry, Beth. Yes. I was just gonna say, we had a question in chat from Seth uh, regarding whether the, uh, the work would require prevailing wage to be paid. Uh, no, it does not. That is my understanding. All right, I'll keep. There's a long list of things that the project uh, program does not fund, most of which are fairly common sense. Um, today, I wanted to focus on the three that I've bolded. Um, that is reconstruction. Uh, it, you know, if, if your downtown has a, a hole in it from a missing historic structure, 
Uh, you cannot rebuild a structure to fill that space with this program. Uh, we can also not fund uh, additions, and that includes the addition of an exterior elevator enclosure. That doesn't mean you can't do these things as part of the project, but it wouldn't be included in the project budget. It wouldn't be reimbursable with the grant. We're also not interested really in funding routine maintenance. Um, the, the idea of this program is to be impactful on the local community and the local economy. So we want this to be uh, kind of a, a, a major turnaround kind of project for an important property in your community. And finally, um, we want to be focusing on the structure, the roof, the windows, the storefront, uh, and making the property inhabitable. Uh, furnishings and decorations uh, can be covered with other funding. Are there any uh, questions on what we're not funding? I, I would have a question. Um, I see that um, exterior elevator ex enclosures are not permitted. What about new interior elevator enclosures? Yes, that would be considered an eligible cost. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, I have a question not on this, but you mentioned um, the properties that are eligible being uh, income producing properties. Is there a uh, some type of a cost benefit analysis that needs submitted with this or how is that determined? Well, in the project description, we will be asking you to tell us about the current and intended use of the property. And hopefully that would be kind of self-evident in that description that it will be, you will, that a party will derive income, uh, you know, from either as a result, either it currently does, or as a result of the project, it will derive income. Does that okay. answer the question? That includes a lease. Like if you're paying rent to someone, that's income. To someone. Okay. Okay. That, um, excuse that's me, helpful. Buddy. Uh, could you tell me, I know that it's a uh, restoration, but we have uh, one restroom right now and we want to um, make uh, ADA compliant restrooms. Would that be an eligible project? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. I There's see also we have a question. A yeah. Right Frank. Question. Uh, so Tiffany asks, would the project be limited to public use only or would residential housing be eligible? So as far as owner occupied residential housing, something that you live in as the owner, that would not be an eligible project property a residential use that is an apartment in a downtown building that could be an eligible uh, housing use. Okay. Finally, in my section here, um, a condition of receiving federal funding under this program includes the requirement to execute what's called a preservation covenant. This is a document whereby the property owner um, agrees to maintain the property and keep it in good order for a particular period. Given the size of these grants, we anticipate that covenants will range will be either 15 or 20 years, which is a long time, and it, and it is, but that is the um, rule currently of this program. Uh, Covenant is uh, a, an agreement entered with the Ohio History Connection, and in this case, it is recorded with the property deed so that if a property changes ownership, the covenant uh, follows with the deed. This sounds like a huge, big deal, and um, hopefully it would not be. Uh, the National Park Service is looking to protect the investment of 
public funding in historic properties. What would happen is during the term of the covenant, um, the Main Street Organization and Heritage Ohio and ultimately the State Preservation Office would be uh, requesting uh, every few years a brief report and a couple of photos at, of the property uh, showing that um, you, know, you haven't put a big addition on the front or you haven't sandblasted the brick and that the property is being reasonably uh, maintained. We, we do this for uh, a variety of other uh, funding programs that we've had over the years and um, it can be survived. <laughs> um, most of the work on these buildings we anticipate will be of a nature, well, let me just, let me start over. There is also a public access requirement with these covenants. Um, I, I really doubt that any of the properties that we'll be uh, working with under this program will end up requiring public access. One reason is um, properties will be open to the public anyway, because they might be commercial. Uh, in the case of rental, re uh, rental residential, um, we don't expect to be working with spaces that are highly architecturally or historically significant. Uh, you know, no Tiffany windows involved, that sort of thing, which is when uh, Park Service would want a property to be accessible to the public. Uh, thirdly, the work um, will be, a lot, I assume, a lot of exterior or interior systems and uh, fix-up work. So there, there is a provision for public access. Uh, I really don't think it will even come into play with these projects. Can I take any questions on this? Um, we have uh, an upstairs opera house, but it is not accessible. If we keep our work um, to the downstairs right now, then that would be acceptable? Yes, you certainly don't have to open the building to look at anything other than the grant assisted work if you were ha having to open it at all. All right, thank you. Okay, any other questions on, on anything I've talked about here? All right, I will continue down the page here and turn it over to Frank to talk about the application form itself. Thanks, Mary Beth. So um, the way the application form is going to work, we have it in two major components. We have project information on the one hand, and we have Main Street applicant information. And those are two components of that application that um, you will need to fill out. In order to get the application to us, we have set up a Dropbox which um, we have um, actually, Mary Beth, how about if you go ahead and stop sharing and I'll bring up the Dropbox real quick. Well, let's hope that's the right one. Okay, does everyone see uh, Heritage Ohio Paul Brune applications at the top of their screen? Do you see that? Great. So what we have done, and I will share the Dropbox link with everyone. Um, what we have done is we have created folders for each community that's eligible to apply. So for example, we have Cambridge. So as you fill out the application form components, if you have additional say contractor estimates and then for pictures that you take that we're going to ask for, you just take all of that information, you go to Cambridge in the Dropbox form and you 
uh, download all of your information in there. So for all the communities, that's the way that we will get the information from you. So we're hoping it's a nice, easy way to uh, get application info to us. So um, Mary Beth, I guess if you could go back to the guidelines form. Yes. There we go. All right, so as Mary Beth mentioned, and um, I guess you could just do a, a quick scroll through these. We're going to have these applications due February 8th of 2021. We have a big piece of this application form is going to be scoring to try to press as objective as possible zero to 100 points and it's going to be based on community factors and it's also going to be based on the project factors themselves with the um, buildings with the building projects that you bring to us there will also be a portion of the points that are determined by poverty level in the community and unemployment rates in the community so we're showing you the point information so you have that it's going to be the grant selection committee that's going to actually be doing the scoring so you don't have to worry about the scoring just completing the narratives with the different questions so that we have a sense of what you're going to be able to accomplish with the grant so um, scrolling through a little bit further, as Mary Beth mentioned, we're hoping to have a big announcement at Statehood Day in March. And um, once our initial grants are awarded, we're going to have uh, between SHPO and the building owners, and Mary Beth or Amanda, stop me if I miss any of this, that it, it will be the SHPO and the building owner who enter into a contract to complete the grant project and ultimately receive the reimbursement at the close of the project. Heritage Ohio, we're administering it. So we're going to be the point of contact with the Main Street programs and with the property owners throughout the process. So um, scrolling down a little bit further, uh, Mary Beth mentioned procurement uh, bid processes um, that, you know, ideally receiving three bid proposals, uh, making sure it's a transparent process is going to be important. Uh, the progress reports. Do you want to talk about uh, reimbursement or expand on that at all, Mary Beth? Yes, uh, we plan to set up the grant agreement to provide for one partial payment um, during the project if the uh, owner so desires, and then the balance will be paid at the conclusion of the project. Uh, any reimbursement request would need to be accompanied by uh, documentation of the work completed and that the um, this is reimbursement. So again, the property owner should pay the contractor, show us that they've paid, submit documentation and photos of the work completed to date and um, request reimbursement. So it is important that uh, what is being reimbursed is for completed work rather than, well, we're 50% of the way finished with the roof uh, can you give us a reimbursement? You know, we, we would want an aspect of the project work to be complete in order to get a reimbursement. And it doesn't have to be, you know, exactly half or anything like that. It's just a partial payment during the project. Does that make sense? And uh, I just saw a message from Mitch come across the screen. He said, um, can I get a copy of the worksheet uh, to follow the guidelines and application forms? 
So this will all be available uh, Friday afternoon on Heritage Ohio's website, the guidelines document, the application information, and I'll get into that a little bit more here in just a little bit. And then um, I see a comment from Shannon saying that uh, for our really challenging projects, we've had trouble getting three bids from contractors. Um, so what if we send it out to bid and then only receive one or two bids back? How might that affect it, Mary Beth? Right, that's fine. The, the idea is to show that you approached three or four or five contractors and attempted to receive multiple proposals. So the, I, the important thing is to just document your process. And I see a comment. Uh, does the complete construction project need to be completed by the closure of the grant? And I would say that would that would be a yes, but if other people have other comments. Didn't we talk about phases? Well, so I would say for what the construction project is outlined in the grant application that that would need to be completed. But say going back to the Opera House question where we're doing a first floor, the second floor has not been touched. It will not be touched as part of the grant. That it's, it's you do not have to have a completely completed uh, building. But if the property is placed in service, at least in part as a result of this project, um, you're definitely going to score higher than a project that to mothball a building, you know, to fix the roof and, and that's all. Right, we definitely, we did not want to see these as um, mothball projects, as Mary Beth mentioned or as this is the first year in a 10 year process. Um, the idea is to really show some impact in rehabilitation, positive impact, and that there's a building that's nearly fully utilized or fully utilized, whereas maybe it had been partially or completely vacant before. So the um, project start dates, important to note that, so if a, an award is made March 1st, um, construction contracts have to be executed within three months. So by the start of June, and then hopefully construction is underway just as soon as those contracts are executed. And then we see December 31 of 22 as being the project completion date. So you have a full construction season, uh, 21, you have all of 22 to be able to finish it. And Mary Beth, kind of talked about reimbursement. Reimbursement. Based on invoices. Um, yeah, but we, we do encourage you to um, secure full financing so that uh, you're not counting on the grant uh, as, uh, as anything except reimbursement of cost. At the end, we'll ask for a, a fairly straightforward uh, final project report, um, just restating the final scope and a final budget and final photographs. All right, here's the application form itself. Okay. so. Why don't you go ahead and stop sharing, Mary Beth, okay. and I will open the application forms on my computer. So I am going to start with, okay. Does everyone see project information at the top of the page? Yes. Okay. Excellent. So this is a six page application form. 
So if you have two projects, we'll expect you to complete two project information forms. So what we have, I'm gonna shrink this down a little bit. So as you might expect, we start out asking for some basic information about the property. You see that we mentioned the National Register Historic District name and reference number. And again, the SHPO can assist with those efforts to find that information for you. As with a lot of applications that we have, we are asking for uh, congressional representation, who is representing you. You'll see at the bottom of the screen, uh, we just asked for a confirmation that the property is either income producing now or will become income producing at the end of the project. We have a project abstract, which is just three, three lines to succinctly say what you want to do to the property. And we're looking at a full exterior rehab of John Smith's historic commercial block. And then a little more space to uh, get into a fuller discussion of what you're proposing to do on the project. We also include a work schedule. Um, it's, it's not going to be perfect. We know that construction projects are very fluid and it depends on a lot of different moving parts but we want to see that you have an idea for how you would like to see the work proceed from beginning to end. So we're all on the same page at the start. So you fill that out. Uh, you see at the bottom, we have a financial summary. We wanna get a basic idea of what's the grant amount requested. What is the cash match? Again, it's a 90-10. So for instance, we might say, amount requested 90,000, cash match 10,000, total project budget 100,000. Frank, um, regarding yeah. the schedule, I mm -hmm. wanted to um, make a point of saying that we uh, applicants should work in, this is not just to lay out the construction process, but all of the steps involved with managing the grant, you know, so you'll have your uh, preparation of plans and specs and the process of bidding and all that business and reporting to Heritage Ohio. We want, we want you to work all this into your schedule so you can really see how long it will take to do everything that needs to be done. Okay, great point. And then we have uh, an expanded budget where if, so if it's strictly we're going to repoint the entire front of our building, you see on the masonry line, you'd fill in what your proposed cost will be, um, what your proposed match share would be, and the total. So let's say it's $50,000 and uh, you want $45,000 from the grant. You're, you will match it with $5,000 for a total of $50,000 in masonry work. At the bottom of that page, we're asking for those matching share sources. So that could be personal capital. It could be a bank loan. It could be a philanthropic donor. It could be the Main Street program. Um, we don't really care where the match comes from so much as long as you have a confirmed match with the exception of no other federal funds, correct? No other federal funding except for community, de block, community development block grant funds should, should any of that be available locally that can be used to match this grant. So yes, yeah, so CDBG funds can be used to help match it. Frank, I wanna uh, point out a couple of details that we did not include in, in this document yet. One is um, we are going to have a, a minimum grant request of $50,000 for this program. And uh, you were just about to talk about the matching share. We do wanna uh, see a breakdown of your matching share sources. And we will also be asking the status of that. 
you don't necessarily have to have it all in in the bank this moment, uh, but we want to see that you uh, anticipate match from the, the various sources if that is the status of the money. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now we'll get into that uh, zero to 100 points, the scoring for it. So we have a few questions, including give us an idea of the historic significance of the property. So, you know, it's a National Register listed building. It's important to the community because of X, Y, and Z. We want to get a sense of why the community values and treasures the building. So we give you uh, a few lines to talk about that. And then we're asking about the economic impact that the project could have on the local economy. So there could be positive economic impacts that come about because of the construction. There could be positive economic impacts that come about because someone is moving from out of town to lease the storefront and start a new business and that will generate a certain amount of jobs or we're reactivating upstairs spaces and that will result in property tax collection, new jobs, which will result in income tax collection. So tell us about the different pieces of the positive economic impact that you hope that this project will bring about. And then on the next page, we ask about a uh, project need. So a classic grant application question. Sell us that the Paul Broom grant is the perfect grant funding for the need that um, is exhibited. So that it's helping the long-term preservation of the building, that um, the work that you're doing complies with secretary standards like Mary Beth mentioned, that you're not sandblasting the brick, that you're not replacing the historic windows, that you're reconditioning them, things like that. So we have a good sense of the need and the work that will be done uh, on the project. We have simple yes, no questions. As we mentioned that this grant is really hoping to help bring new downtown living units so there is a 10 point question. If this project creates new apartment units, then that receives an additional 10 points. Uh, the same from reactivated spaces. If we have a building that is vacant, partially vacant, underutilized, and those spaces will become reactivated, again, a yes gives you 10 points. Finally, we have some uh, basic community demographics. So poverty rate, depending on the poverty rate level, you could secure one to five points. Depending on the unemployment rate, again, you could secure one to five points. Finally, uh, if your community is a certified local government, that would be another 10 points towards the 100 points on the scoring. So that is the project piece of it. Let me move over to the Main Street piece of it. So this is easy, easy, easy to complete. We'll ask for contact information from the Main Street program. Main Street America program. I guess we all need to get in the habit of saying that. And then in addition to that, we have a um, checklist for you. So just making sure that um, things like the property owner has a financial wherewithal to complete the project, um, that there is a bookkeeper involved and actually so I just figured out that I missed um, something on this 
I, I apologize. So, gosh, scrolling up to the top on the project information, we're going to ask for the property owner information, but then we're asking for project coordinator information and project bookkeeper information. Those don't have to be three separate people, but they could be three separate people. Uh, the project coordinator, going back to what Mary Beth said, that could be if you hire an architect uh, who meets uh, standards for working with historic properties, that person could also be the project coordinator. Um, if you have a one person preservation crew, that person could be the property owner, the coordinator, the bookkeeper. But we will have space for their contact information also as part of this project. So I will go back to the Main Street part of it. So the bookkeeper, if there is a separate bookkeeper, we want an assertion that the bookkeeper has the experience and qualifications to be able to manage the project. Um, we wanna make sure that uh, you know, everything has been done by the book according to federal guidelines, all the I's dotted and T's crossed. As Mary Beth mentioned, the execution of a preservation covenant at the close of the project is recorded. Uh, of course, that all the application is complete. Uh, any contractor estimates that you have have been included in the Dropbox folder. And it is okay to give us more images than less images, both the detail shots and overall views. Because think about it from the standpoint that we've never seen this building in our lives and we need to get a good, good sense of what you're proposing to do. And pictures can do such a good job of doing that. So including the pictures and putting those into the Dropbox also. So we have the signature page. If you have two property owners, we have property project number one, property owner signature, coordinator signature, bookkeeper, if you have two projects, we have a second page for project number two. Again, the property owner, project coordinator, project bookkeeper. So that four page document goes with the project form document uh, put into your Dropbox folder. And um, that takes care of the application process. So at this point, I will go ahead and stop share. And Mary Beth, was there more on the guidelines document that we wanted to go through? Um, I don't think so. The, uh, I, I, let's see, I think I can share my screen again. Um, the guidelines will or do include um, application instructions, you know, field by field information on uh, how to complete the field and what we're looking for. Trying to give you as much guidance as possible. In describing your work, uh, we'd like to, for you to uh, state the existing condition of various features and spaces of the building and what you plan to do with the grant. I'll, I'll just point out that the uh, this is a fillable PDF and it will do the math for you if you just enter the um, the grant share and the matching share the totals will magically appear. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, this this just sort of uh, puts on paper everything that we've been saying here today about how to complete the form. We also provide some definitions for the various um, construction categories so you know what to put where of the project costs. Uh, Frank, I will say that we, <clears throat> we are allowing um, the uh, architectural uh, oversight and general administration of the project to be allowable costs. So we need to add those sections to the budget You'll see that uh, in the final form. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you don't have to include those costs. You can limit your, your grant budget to construction only. That's your choice. But we just want to make clear that those are allowable costs. Breakdown of matching share. And again, um, this kind of repeats what Frank was uh, going over as far as um, what we want to see in the uh, community scoring, that, that side of it. Okay. Uh, we do, we would appreciate you following this um, naming convention for your images. That'll just make it easier for everybody to um, know what we're looking at there. If you wanna provide floor plans and key your photo views to a floor plan, that would be great, not required. <laughs> Any questions on that? As Frank said, this will all be up on the web page here in a couple of days. Hey, Mary Beth, um, I will go ahead and see if I can. It's not much to look at right now, <laughs> but you see at the top there, heritageohio.org slash PBHRGP. This is uh, the page that will contain the information. We will have uh, links to past webinars. We will have the application form and the guidelines information. We will have um, links to the standards for rehab. So you can learn more about them and acquaint yourself with what that means, what, what treatments are recommended, what treatments are not recommended. So this page could be the start of your journey in that process. Um, just as a reminder, also, we have, uh, let's see, where is that? Again, next week um, with Mary Angela Feaster from the SHPO, I'm going to go ahead and copy this and drop it in chat. That is the webinar registration link. So everyone, if you haven't signed up yet for the webinar on the standards, uh, that here's your opportunity to do that. I think that is everything that we um, needed to cover. So happy to. Uh, Frank, I was might mention that we did an ADA accessibility because federal money requires ADA accessibility issues. And we did a webinar on that a few weeks ago. That'll be on the website. Mm -hmm. We'll have a link to that webinar. Yeah. And unrelated to that, but I want to share that um, Ohio History Connection will be issuing a news release uh, to papers in all of the eligible communities uh, to let property owners uh, more broadly know that applications are available. For, so for those of you that represent Main Street organizations, um, you may be hearing from new people as a result of uh, that release. And uh, I, I think we had talked about perhaps doing another uh, Zoom meeting uh, be ahead of the application deadline of early February for uh, folks who um, missed this. Even though this is recorded, we'll do another one with the final final of everything available and another opportunity to uh, ask us questions in a live setting. Um, also wanted to make sure that um, we mentioned conflict of interest. So even though 
Heritage Ohio, we have our own conflict of interest policy and it deals with our board members, our committee members. We want to make sure that local programs who are interested in applying for these grant funds are being careful about if an applicant in your community is a member of your local board or is a committee member or someone else who is otherwise intimately involved with um, uh, your Main Street efforts. So in other words, making sure that you're keeping a good uh, paper trail of the process of how you're evaluating uh, potential applicants in your community is critical and making sure that you are doing what you uh, can to avoid even the appearance of any impropriety or a conflict is critical to making sure that this process goes smoothly for everyone involved. And, and that basically means that anyone with a potential conflict needs to declare that to the organization and absent themselves from any discussion, voting, decision-making of any kind on what um, properties the Main Street organization will support for final submission of proposals. And that should be recorded, you know, in some sort of meeting minutes. So it's available to us and to auditors if that should ever happen. So I see that Julie uh, mentioned whether a county owned building on the National Register would be eligible. And Joyce mentioned that uh, if it's income producing, if there is rent generated, if there is a lease for the building and, and rent is charged, then yes, that would potentially be an eligible property. Back to our opera house, did I understand you to say that um, even though the second floor is not ADA, accessible that we might be able to include some work on the second floor? Uh, we we'll talk with you very, very closely about that. Um, our understanding from the National Park Service is that grant spaces that are worked on with grant funds should achieve uh, some level of ADA compliance. And did you mention that the elevator inside would be eligible? Yes. Adding an elevator inside would be an eligible cost so long as you know significant features are not uh, destroyed in the process of, of including that addition. Uh, I would also say that our understanding from the National Park Service is that you know if if eighty percent of your project is uh, occurring on the first floor and that's um, already accessible or will be as a result of this project and a small amount of work is done on an inaccessible space that that could probably fly. Um, all of these projects have to be um, handled on a case-by-case -case basis and we're what, ready and willing to help um, make these uh, judgments, but we will have to work with you uh, case by case. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was also true for upper floor housing. Right. There was a minimum, uh, if it's a smaller uh, floor plate, it doesn't have to have elevator access. I mean, they're, again, going back to that webinar right. on ADA accessibility answers a lot of these questions. Mm -hmm. So I see that uh, Shannon asked, uh, if there's a fraternal organization that charges dues, would that be eligible as income producing like a Masonic Lodge? And it's not necessarily if an entity charges dues to members, it's more of does a Masonic Lodge, um, who owns the building? Is it the Masonic Lodge? And um, are there other entities that pay rent? to the Masonic Lodge? Or does a third party aside from the Masonic Lodge own the building? 
And is there some sort of rent? It, it's not necessarily a dues for a fraternal organization that I think would qualify. Um, but if you have questions like these that are um, maybe a little more of a gray area, we're happy to uh, talk more with you about it. I imagine there also might be a public access question with the Masonic Lodge because of the, the secrecy involved. <laughs> Um, so that's something we should really talk through. So any other questions? Is everyone scared off or is everyone super excited? <laughs> I hope everyone is really excited about this <laughs> right? because bricks and mortar federal funding in the form of a grant is so rare that um, we're excited that this opportunity is here and for rural small towns, super rare, right? So um, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. We know that um, we're not surprised because we have to deal with federal hoops all the time. Um, but we are really excited about it. We hope that you are too. We're excited to see what projects you come up with. We think they'll be really great. So um, please, please, please apply. And we're here to support you and help you through it all. I'm and surprised for Mitch, no one else. For Mitch, I know I owe you uh, an update on your Main Street grants. I, I will tell everyone who's, who's been involved with Main Street grants, I am super excited because instead of me juggling 100 projects, I'm juggling more like between four to eight projects. <laughs> so it's not gonna be an admin nightmare for me. I, I wanted to share with you that there will be an independent jury of selecting these projects. It won't be us. Um, they will be meeting on February 25th. So again, that's why you have to give them the information. They know nothing about what you've done to this point, who you are, what reputation you have. They know nothing and you are competing against each other. So telling that story so that the jurors understand that impact is really important. And because we are not involved in the selection, we will be advocates for all of the applications. So send us drafts, you know, if you have any questions or want input, want some eyes on your application, we are happy to review and make recommendations. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Mary Beth. Um, we talked a little bit about it and we said that uh, we would be happy to look at applications through, was it January 15th, I think. Right, mid-January. Mm -hmm. So, right, if you want some guidance on whether you're on the right track or not, um, yeah, we're happy to take a look at those ahead of the grant deadline, application deadline. Mary Beth Sills asked if uh, they could submit videos. Yeah, you can. All right, well, Joyce, why don't you take us home? <laughs> well, I think that's it. Like I said, wrapping up, um, we want to help you get this money. You know, we're, we're excited about it too. Watch those AD, the ADA grant, watch Secretary of Interior standards. It's so important that the building owners understand those um, guidelines, so to speak, both in the ADA and the Secretary of Interior's guidelines. And again, we're, we're here to help you, but there's a lot of information available and uh, we have all January to get them written and keep asking us questions. Thanks everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you all.